Windows invite. This guy is crazy. He'd be stuck coming in crazy. That's it. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a valid thing. I just kind of want to see. It was, your, it was your other friend. Two friends of mine that live out there. They were both skiing on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday was completely different. Oh, really? Oh, no. it's so hard on Saturday. Sunday, we got up at four. That'd be a beautiful day. Yeah. Hi. Stop talking about me. I'm right here. <laughs> I'm right here. Looking at you. Do you want me to get me. started? Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I know you're right there. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I got you made the big screen. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February Education Committee meeting. We have a number of um, agenda items tonight. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, an update on the junior senior high school school improvement plan. And uh, Principal Michael Brooks is with us. I'm like Good Zoom evening. and in London, in person. Yeah, I'm in person, that's right. Yeah. I'm looking up everybody's remote. <laughs> yeah. I gotta be here. It's been quite a day, but everybody got home safe today, so that was a bonus. Yeah. Mike, is your mic on? Okay, closer. awesome, yes. thank you. All right, excuse me. Um, I sent you information um, regarding the school improvement um, plan as far as details and update. Um, so I'm just going to provide you a brief update of where we're at uh, with the school improvement plan. And from the information I provided, as you can see, uh, we've made progress on the school improvement plan and the action steps that are outlined in the plan over the past um, year and a half. Um, we haven't abandoned the work regardless of the pandemic. And you know, although some timelines have changed and some implementation dates may have changed because of um, what we're dealing with, uh, we continue to push forward as a group. Um, and just to, uh, also an FYI that our, our monthly ATSI meetings that we have at the IU have also been um, postponed. The most recent one has been postponed because they're waiting for more guidance from PDP. So, when and how, and if that happens, um, then we'll have uh, additional meetings. We also have been attending those. Um, so two important areas um, that I wanted to focus on and to give you an update was on the MTSS process, which would be big for us at the junior senior high school and our uh, master's schedule implementation. The MTSS process, um, we begin the process, um, and this will be a change in thinking and a change in culture, how we provide interventions for our struggling learners, both academically and behaviorally. Um, it's gonna be a big step forward. Um, we feel um, that this will, actually, will help with student achievement and reduce failures um, over time. Uh, we are excited to um, have Sarah Clues join us as one of our new instructional support teachers. Um, that was a key piece to um, the puzzle in really getting this ramped up and rolling. Um, so we've been uh, meeting as a group, um, pushing out information to the staff, um, slowly providing them with some professional development on, on the MTSS process. Part of the MTS pro MTSS process um, at the school will be also the positive um, behavior intervention supports of PBIS, which is going to help us um, provide intervention for students who are struggling behaviorally and restorative practices piece. Um, which promotes inclusion and relationship building 
uh, through restorative measures. We're going to go use that through our ISS process. Um, and instead of focusing on the punishment, um, the way of influencing students is really going to address the underlying reasons for the behavior and help change the behavior. One other big piece of the MTSS process is changing of the role of our ISD, our instruction support teachers. Um, typically, um, they were in a classroom and teachers just, they were having issues, academic or behaviorally as a kid, they would send them out to those teachers. That's no longer going to be the role. Those teachers are going to be working collaboratively with, collaboratively with the staff and the classroom teacher, pushing in, providing them strategies, more tier one, um, some of the initial interventions to help those students be successful. So we've changed that role. That's a change in culture and a way of thinking. Um, we're we'll working through that um, with the staff. So we're excited about that process. We think it's going to serve us well in the long run. And we're looking forward to really getting that implemented and up and running. The master schedule update um, that's our biggest undertaking. And I'll just go through I've provided you a very detailed timeline of what we've done so far and where we're at. Um, with the process, I'll just go through that with you. Um, and our biggest thing is we feel that we need to get back to the normal year, um, the normal schedule, um, to really push forward uh, something with the changes big. So, you know, in the fall of 2019, prior to me coming on, um, we began the process for developing and implementing a new master schedule um, with the plan of implementation for the 2021 school year. We had planning meetings in November 19, December of 19. And January 2020. After planning meetings in 2020, we felt that we were close to 7 to 12 schedule um, that would fit the needs of the junior senior high school. Of course, in March, um, that all changed um, and our focus became ensuring continuity education for our, our students during the pandemic. Um, and as we entered the school year this year, our main focus was on making sure we can you know, create a hybrid schedule a scenario where our students were able to be back here with six feet of social distancing and, and creating that. So it's kind of where we're at right now. In October of 2020, we reached out to a scheduling consultant um, so we can begin the conversation of creating the new master schedule once again. Um, after the conversation, we realized two models um, that he thought would work best for us in the 7 12 building, where um, the junior senior high school, where the block schedule we're currently utilizing with some minor adjustments for our um, hybrid and also um, the eight period slash block schedule we were working with um, at the close of last school year. Um, so two two scheduling uh, models that you know we, we thought um, we or we were working with we thought would work. So after this initial meeting, we reached back out to follow up, um, and you again with everything he was waiting on work for another big project and would be in touch. And yeah, from him. Um, but during that time, we began the conversation of moving the junior senior high school from our traditional quarters um, calendar that we're on now um, to a trimester calendar that would fit the district and be consistent K to 12. The K to 6 on a trimester calendar, so three nine week, three 12 week um, grading periods where the junior senior high school are all in four nine week um, grading periods. So we began to look at that. Um, what we did was we asked our PLCs and we've really utilized the PLCs for a lot of work. Um, we've asked for their, we provided them information on trimesters. We asked them to uh, meet with the PLCs and provide us some feedback, pros, cons, concerns, thoughts um, that they had on um, the trimesters. After receiving that feedback, we reviewed it and then we scheduled a meeting with the Dallastown Area School District um, to discuss their move from traditional quarters to um, a trimester um, type calendar. Uh, we met, um, we provided them with the information we received from our PLCs so that can kind of guide our discussion um, around trimesters. We met with the high school principal and their director of counseling during this meeting. Um, we, we shared out some ideas and we, we talked through the different points and, and they stated to move the trimesters from the traditional quarters calendar um, is at least a two to three year process. Um, it's not something that could be done in just five months at the end of one school year. Um, it's quite a process. And, and I did provide examples. They provided us with some examples of certain things we're going to need to do um, before we can even consider um, moving the trimesters. We, it's it's the, the curriculum and pacing um, need done for courses. Again, 
Uh, we have to redo all our, resubmit every single course to the NCAA, um, which is a huge undertaking um, for guidance. There's professional development for staff, there's community feedback, student feedback. They provided us with a, a, a detailed list of, of information um, on that. So um, they also were on an eight period block, an eight period traditional day um, prior to moving to trimesters. When they moved the trimesters, they went to a three by five block schedule. Um, and they said, no matter what you do, because we talked to them about us moving forward the new master schedule for the junior senior high school, they said they can't be two separate moves. Those moves need to happen together. Their moves happen together for a more seamless transition. Uh, so um, we decided, you know, we needed, we feel we need more time to investigate and move the trimesters and new master schedule. That's one school. Um, and you'll see in the, in the timeline I provided, so some ways we're going to reach out and try to find more schools in the Commonwealth in the area who are on the actual trimester schedule. Um, we've looked up some and some have moved back to quarters. Some, so we're going to try and find schools um, that will help us and guide our, our, our discussion. And again, we feel we need to be purposeful in our planning and the implementation of this change to make sure it's seamless and what's the best for our students and, and our staff. So the following timeline, we we're asking you um, that we use um, to investigate the feasibility of moving to possibly to a trimester calendar and develop a new master schedule. So from February to the rest of the school year through the summer, um, continue to meet with the PLCs and we've been utilizing the PLCs um, for our school improvement. Parents and student leaders to further discuss further the discussion on the new master schedule and discuss the possible move to trimester. I'm going to reach out to our principal association. Um, to see if they have uh, information on schools in the state who also operate on the trimester um, calendar. Um, and then and that, as we start into the next school year, as things kind of settle down, hopefully things open up a little more. Um, we're going to plan site visits and or virtual meetings to schools to find and finalize the new master schedule format, particularly those schools with, that are operating on the trimester um, site calendar. And then from that information, we'll be able to finalize the recommendation as to whether that move, that trimester calendar is what's best for our students and staff, and we'll be able to roll out the final plan to the board and, and the community. And then in January of 2022, in May, we'll begin to set the scheduling process for students utilizing whatever master schedule we land on and or the possible um, calendar. In June, to the, the summer of the 2022, we're going to continue that will be continued to work on finalizing that schedule, signing everything up, and making sure everything's ready to go for the kids when in September of 2022 and start um, with the new master schedule and all possible contractors. So, a lot, a lot of work has gone into it. There's still a ton to do. Um, um, you know, we're, we're, we're excited about it. Uh, you know, we're looking forward to it. We think that, you know, if it's what fits best for us, and that'll be a move that. We feel best benefit our kids and we'll make that move. Mike, in your conversations um, with any of the ATSI work that, or the conversations that you've had with the IU, because they are ultimately the point of contact for our ATSI plan, um, have they given you any indication? You know, since we didn't give the PSSA and the Keystone exam last year, and we're not certain what the future of the PSSA and the Keystone exam is this year. What data are they going to use to determine whether or not we continue to be in this ATSI school improvement process or to, to get out? Because originally when we got in, right. it was three years, right. right? So, you know, the sentence was three years and, you know, the data was going to come from, um, you know, whether it would be our PSSA scores or our Keystone exam scores you know, our ability to improve on those exams was going to determine whether we remained in ATSI or we slipped into whatever, um, I think it's CSI, which is the corrective school improvement. Are they giving you any indication as to what the metric, the framework is going to be? I believe that's what our topic of our next meeting was going to be, but it's since been delayed because they're waiting again on God, further guidance from uh, PDE as it relates to Keystone PSSA. Because we could quite possibly be going two years without any type of accountability data to put towards the framework that they've created for CSI and ATSI schools. In our last ATSI meeting, there was no 
no talk of data or the testing. I think because at that point nobody, again, what's the way for guidance? So, and again, everything's on hold. We're going to still continue to push forward with some of this stuff that like, we think is going to make a difference in our achievement. Um, but, you know, a lot of the next meeting, which was supposed to be March 4th, I think it was, March 4th, has been pushed out. Is there, a, I mean, I can imagine at the state level, they're probably struggling themselves trying to think about what they would use as criteria. Um, is there anything that we can look at to offer as a suggestion for them on what we know about the performance of our students to be able to um, make uh, make some analysis of uh, student performance to be able to show progress against the uh, actions in school improvement? I'm not sure because I think it's going to be all based off that, the, the standardized test of the, the state level. And how the subgroups, how the subgroups yeah, how the right, subgroups right, you know, so for a moment I was thinking, well, you know, could I use our SAT data or AP data or no, it's not going to apply because the APSI designation is specifically for subgroups. So it's going to have to be some type of benchmark testing that can assess how those subgroups are performing. I can't, I can't see them using that against us this year, but we'll never say never. Uh, we're, not, we're not using it for evaluation purposes right. of staff, so I can't see them using that. And I think what they, the data they just wanted to get for the test this year was see where that gap, the achievement gap is. Right. I can't see them. So do they extend our APSI? And again, these are all things I can ask at the next APSI meeting. Um, you know, I don't have it, but again, it's all going to depend on PD guidance. And, is it, is it just the um, benchmark scores that are on the, on the standardized test that's exit criteria for getting a cost school group? Pretty much. Well, we, yeah, and we, there, are, there are like, I can share the plan with you. You'll see like where, you know, we have where we want to get above a certain percentage in our students to have on those advanced group meeting yeah. proficiency. But we also have these other action steps that outline the plan that we continue to do progress report, a quarterly progress on the data on the RPSI plan. When I go in, I can't put anything in for the PSSA keystone, right, right. Um, but I am able to put our progress in. Against actions. Yeah, against yeah, yeah. Actions. yeah, I understand. Yeah. A lot of good work going into the initiatives and actions that are part of the school improvement plan. I was just asking about the, uh, the data. data. Yeah, the how, data. We, how we get out of it. Yeah. How we get out of it. Yeah. I got some questions. Um, I guess it's about the trimesters. What's the purpose behind it? And then I'll just let you answer them all at the same time here. Um, then you said there were some schools that went to trimesters and went back to quarters. Why did they go back? That's what we. That's what yeah. we're. That's why when I asked our principal, the principal yeah. association is really going to be able to give us that information on the schools. Like I know East Pensboro was one when I searched schools in PA on a trimester. East Pensboro come up, but you go out to the East Pensboro site, and it, it, to me, there's not. A lot of clear information, but to me, from the way it looks on their site and from the way their calendar is broken down, it looks back on a quarter calendar. I mean, if that's in the school they give us, you know, I'd love to reach out to them. Why did you switch back? Why did you go in the first place? Why did you switch back? All right. So I think it's going to be very important to us. It's easy to get Dallas, Dallas Towns information um, on their move, but I think we need more than just one because they're, they're a larger school with a different, you know. Um, set up than we are. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, it's interesting to hear what they had to say. They gave us a lot of great feedback on it yeah. and some of the steps we need to take if we're going to make that move. Um, but it's also going to be good to hear other schools who possibly went to, went back, yeah. or have moved and had success. And I know Dallas Town was an APSI school when we did ask that. Um, he said, uh, I think I was correct, he said, He's not sure if the move to trimesters was the reason they got off APSI because he would like to think it was a lot of other things they did. And so it's very hard to pin it and point on just that one on that one move. Because that's the other thing I wrote down was we have a lot of courses that are half year courses. So that's kind of how that fit in there. Yeah, we would have to look at the impact yeah. of that. Yeah. 
Yes. And that's the curriculum and the pacing. And yes. He, he said one of the biggest undertakings they had was resubmitting all their courses at the NCA for approval. The NCA clearing house for kids who may want to go on the plane for just one or two sports. He said it was that was a huge undertaking. Oh, yeah. yeah it, it kind of surprised me actually reading through um, and seeing the thing about the move to trimesters because. And, and as you're talking about it, it sounds like a lot of work. And I would think that, like Dallas Town, be, before, before, like, if I were you, before I would go into all of that, like, what did they get? Like, what's the, what's the advantage of it? Because you're, you're, you're listing out. Unless you're setting us up to, to, to then tell us that we looked real close at trimester and it's best for us to stay on cruise, right? Um, because it's, uh, and I don't mean set up, you know, I just mean like you're, you're, you're laying the groundwork, right, so that we see the, the, the whole uh, level of effort. Um, but I know that we went to trimesters for K-6 for some good reasons, right? But you're talking about a curriculum structure in the 7 to 12 that you're, you're just starting to see all of the work that would go into trying right. to make that trimester setup. And unless, if, again, if I were you, um, unless I saw like dramatic improvement in student performance and flexibility in what we can offer our students um, and, you know, some tangible result, is it a hill worth uh, right. climbing? You know, Brian, I'm gonna I'm gonna dovetail with, with what you just said because I'm I'm actually a little confused in that when we look at scheduling, the whole reason I recall that we went to change our schedule was to help the seventh and eighth grade math um, classes because they were not meeting five days a week. That was the reason. That's what we were solving for initially. So I'm not quite sure how this morphed into a scheduling they got delayed till the 21-22 school year and it all of a sudden got into this whole conversation about trimester which from the information it looks like the trimester is now leading the whole movement to change the schedule and we have no data or anything to show why trimester would work um, we haven't even seen data about how it's working in k through six i don't understand the switch and how we're not back to the original intent of solving seventh to eighth grade math and why this is now out three or four more years. Like, it's ridiculous. I don't quite grasp um, what, what happened here and what's the point. And we've not, not even had discussions about trimester. And to Brian's point, that's a lot of work for our staff that's already doing multiple other things. And we haven't solved our original issue. So that's a good point. Um, we're using this as an opportunity to look at everything, to explore every possible option in order to get the best scheduling scenario that we can for our kids. Um, and then, you know, one of the challenges we have right now is, is the whole status of ATSI. What does it mean and what kind of support are we going to continue to get from the IU and the Pennsylvania Department of Education to address some of the concerns, right? So. Um, the pandemic did put us back a year. I mean, that's, um, it's, as, as the board knows, just the day to day right now is a challenge for us and trying to plan long term um, and establish what our priorities are, what we have to get done now and then tomorrow and then the next week and then the next month. Um, so we felt it was in the best interest of the junior senior high to take the additional time and see is trimester for us, you know, as well, because the calendar that the organization currently has, we have parents who have kids K to 12, and they're following one scenario K to six, and another scenario seven to 12. Um, and as some of our parents know, um, especially members of our school board, right, who have kids in, in school, uh, K to six year doesn't line up with a seven to 12 year. Right, because of some things, um, you know, the clerical day concept that's in the collective bargaining agreement, how the half days line up at the end of a marking period or at the end of a trimester. And, and so we were looking at everything, right? 
um, ultimately saying what's best for student success. But you're absolutely right. I mean, seventh and eighth grade math scores, um, that's part of, because of the subgroups that we got in a TSI, and, you know, in the first place. Does three, you mentioned, uh, Mike, you mentioned three by five. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that get you your seventh and eighth? Is, is trimester is the path to three by five and three by five a structure? Is there a schedule that gets you the seven and eighth path? Yeah, I can, I can send you, I can send you the information that we've gathered from all over on trimesters. And, and a lot of the schools either are, a lot of them operate on a three by five block because it just fits better. Does that give, would that give you, would three by five give seventh and eighth grade math, math every day? It okay, can, yes. Was, when, when you do the try, you can plan like the seventh and eighth grade math course to meet every day, every day, every trimester. Right. Some courses will only meet like two of the three trimesters. But you can plan those. We talk about the four courses meeting every, every day. day all year long. So yes, it can get you that. Is the way that maybe approach it is if you're trying to you're trying to get I mean, seven to, and it's not just spend seven to eight but that's what we were here that's what we were here um, look at this look at the schedule you want like what what schedule is ideal for students and then structure around that instead of what what are different ways that we could try to get the uh, the schedule you, you see what you guys see what you like what do you want? And then lay out how you get there. Because it, it feels it feels um, like let's open let's open up all the if you don't scope, you're gonna you're never gonna pick a schedule. So you, you know what I mean? Because the ne the next thing that I'd like to consider is um, what if we change the school year? Like how far do you what you have to put boundaries around it. Like I could say, you know, because Michelle and I have had a side conversation about this. Like what if we were to look at going a year or a week later, start a week earlier, shorten the summer. Uh, we know that uh, summer laps is a fallback period for student learning. So I would expect that our students would perform better to if we shorten the summer break in some way or another and then lengthen breaks during the year. So we maybe have a week long spring break and a week long fall break longer time around the year-end holiday, all, all because it would improve student performance. Right. But if I lay that out, that could be another year. You see what I mean? Like, right. like draw draw some, put some arms around uh, right. the schedule, put a schedule. I, I still am questioning and trying to understand what the purpose of is of trimester, how that's going to help student achievement and how we're diverting from our original I the thing that we were trying to solve for, I just, we haven't given any, we haven't been provided with any data that explains why trimester helps student achievement. And in a way it seems we're going three or four years of blowing everything up to start all over again. And each time we do that, we're two years behind again. And I think everybody's kind of getting sick of that. I, I just hate to see our staff go down a path for, I, we've not even been, it's been not been fully vetted out. If, if I can jump in, this is Matt, I'm remote, obviously. Um, I guess I'll sort of triple down on what both Brian and, and Lisa have said. It just seems like such a huge undertaking with everything else we have going on. We've only really been at this a short time in the K to six. I, I can't imagine we have a whole lot of data to compare a, a baseline to a a delta, whatever you want to call it. It's, and I know the, the logic of trying to align things, but it's such a big change considering school improvement, considering the COVID lag, considering everything else we got to deal with. I guess you can dip your toe in it and see where it leads you. But I, my recommendation would be don't spend a whole lot of time on it because I don't think you're going to, it's not going to be an easy transition. But again, if there's huge value to it, then yeah. But we, we have to see that. Right, that's why I want to reach out to these other school like we need like it, you when you read the, the all the information on it, the, the people who are putting the information on it make it sound like it's 
say all this is a great thing. We need to talk to we talk to one school. Yeah, right. I think we need to talk to some other schools in the state. You're doing why? Why did you do it? What was the reason behind it? What, what benefit did you get from it? You know, and that's just that we're just the beginning of. And again, I can reach out to PA PA EFCC tomorrow. And they can have ten schools for me to talk to. You know, in the next week, and just to find out why. Find out, find out why you went to it and you went back from it. So, you know, I think I think we always get that information first and, and try to and try to you know piece through it and see where I mean, we're at. Why did Dallas Town do it? Like we don't know why Dallas Town did it. I'm assuming they were not in school improvement when they did it. They were. What they what they did was they were on a traditional they're they're in I don't remember correctly, they were in of eight period day, traditional eight period day, and the schedule was a nightmare. The number of courses uh, kids were taking, the number of offerings, uh, it, it really mental, mental health, health of the kids, and the kids trying to play that game of trying to fit as many AP courses or as many other courses into that schedule was an absolute nightmare. And they felt that this wasn't good for the kids. Um, so then they, they investigated the move. But, Again, I, I read something that an opinion article that gave it a D minus. They're moving D minus. Like it wasn't there was there's opinion about that it that wasn't successful. Um, you know, and they said it they, they felt it was good for the mental health of their kids. Um, you know, um, those left kids are taking less courses at one time. They're not trying to just load up eight classes a day and, and just be overwhelmed. Um, I'll gladly reach back out to them again. And again, they they were very open to helping us um, to find out like, specifically, like, all right, maybe, maybe if it's just me and the principal, you know, he may give more information, um, you know, why. And I think he was an assistant principal when the move happened. When the move happened. When the move happened, he was an assistant principal at the time. I guess one of the hard things is, is Mike, I hear you say we're just in the beginning of this process. And I feel like we haven't defined what we're solving for because it's from seven through 12. So are we solving for all the kids that want, the students that want AP courses? Are we solving for mental health? Are we solving for students in seventh and eighth grade in junior high that are struggling with the schedule? Are we solving for parents so that it's convenient that they go between you know, their, their sixth grade student's schedule and their seventh grade student's schedule? I feel like we haven't really figured out what the heck we're solving for and it's changed and we're going down this long process and um, how long is this all going to take? And I, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to grasp how we went from one thing to another and it's huge and nobody's What happened to you? I think we lost it. It sounded sharp and Up here. Is it frontier? She's mute. Lisa, you went on mute. No, I was off. I'm back. Okay. Um, no doubt there's a lot of complexity to all of this, a lot of moving pieces, and, and losing a year to COVID-19 certainly didn't help us. Um, we're solving for everything right now, and, and we're trying to figure out what's the best formula we can put together so that every student can be successful. Just seems to me like we're taking a really huge step, uh, for lack of a better comparison. It's like we're going in for new tires to get new tires on our vehicle and coming out with a new car. Like it just seems like we're a lot. I mean, and we're already, let's see here. So by September of 2022, we'll have implementation of a new master schedule. If everything goes as planned. No, no, you'll have the it's implementation. It's going to be a master schedule. The trimester thing may, but we probably realize that that's not, well, we're going to have a master schedule. We have a couple ideas right now that we've worked on prior that we think may work, but with the investigation in the trimesters. It just seems to me like we're going a really long way to get five days worth of math. <laughs> I mean, that was the original intent, was it not? The trimester thing. 
I didn't see that come. Course, it was to give our students more consistency. Um, but then as you pull the master schedule apart piece by piece, you see other concerns that you need to address along the way, right? Um, you don't want to stop for one thing and then undo a bunch of things. And I think I brought this up a, about a year ago when we were talking about the five days a week for math and stuff like that. I just hope the math department realizes that the biggest homework load these kids have is math. So that one day all sort of lets them catch a breath and catch up on the other things. So I mean, because it seems like the, the most of the homework they do is math and that takes up almost all their time at night. And they're trying to fit in all the other courses. So hopefully if they're going five days a week, they back off on some of that homework load we would be putting a new master schedule in front of you this year if COVID-19 hadn't got in the way. Where, if you think about where the team's time has been spent, right? It's, it's how do we get kids back five days a week? Uh, what are the health and safety procedures that we have to put in place, right? How often is the Pennsylvania Department of Ed, the Chester County Health Department, and the Department of Health changing the guidance and directives that they give them? I mean, we've been dealing with that since March and it's unfortunate that there is a other long-term planning of projects that had to be set aside in order for us to deal with the reality of the day-to-day. -day. And the day-to-day -day has been how does COVID-19 impact everything that we do? We serve at anything else? Hi, you went out, so I honestly didn't hear what just happened. You guys keep going in and out, so I can't, it, You, the sound goes in and out, so I apologize. Can I add something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Would we not be better serving our kids if we stop trying to solve for everything in one fell swoop and take a smaller bite of the apple and solve for, get some minor victories off the table before we start tackling everything at once? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because I know a lot of parents aren't happy with the, the trimesters at the K to six level and then to dump that in at the higher grades. I, I, I'm not sure parents are ready for all that kind of change, that radical, that coming through with everything going on with COVID. Anything else under school improvement? <clears throat> All right, Mr. Brooks does have an extensive update on all things school life activities tonight, everything from the prom, the graduation, spring homecoming, and a whole host of other things. Um, I know Mike and his team have had a number of conversations with our students in the last week or two, um, and he's ready to provide the board with an update. Yep. So I know this is a big topic uh, out there, and, and one thing you know, before I start, one thing we, everybody needs to remember that it's not my activities, it's not our activities, this is the kids' activities. Nobody wants to have these activities more than we do for the kids. Um, and, you know, we're willing to put the time and the effort in to make sure, particularly for our seniors, um, that these things occur and, and we try to give them some normalcy um, through school year. So I gave you an update. And since this, there actually has been some other updates, thanks to Ava and her, her counterparts um, and some of the work that they put in after our meeting um, last week. So for prom, um, we met with advisors last week. We discussed the feasibility, feasibility of the prom with Willow Valley. We have traditional habit. Um, Willow Valley did send us following information. Um, they don't currently have any other proms on their books at this time. Um, their indoor events are running at 10% capacity, so their palm court ballroom only holds 60 guests and their PE ballroom only has 30 guests. That's a total of 90 guests, so that, that indoor will not work there. Um, the event could be held outdoors under a tent, um, which they stated some of the large groups have opted for. Um, of course, depending on their budget. 
So we asked about it. Um, and they have tents that, but the capacity cannot exceed 250 people as per state, as per the state guidelines. Um, and they would send tents up in the parking lot, very price, very prices. Um, and um, you know, alternate sizes are available, but however, it still doesn't change the 250 guests. So we've asked our advisor to reach out to two other um, venues. Avis that you share with me some of the information on what was the place? I can't ever remember. White Jimmy. Yeah, I never. I can't remember that one. Um, um, from they got in last year, and, and our advisors would reach out to them. We asked them all to reach out to Mox and Run, and they reached out to another um, venue, but they were booked for weddings already. So we're we're, we're attempting to get that. Um, unfortunately, though, with the with the um, restrictions on the numbers, no matter where we go, um, we're envisioning it just be only for seniors and it would be limited to locker rare seniors and no outside guests. Um, but with the work of Ava and her counterparts, um, they actually did a survey and they put out a survey on Instagram um, and they told the seniors on Instagram and they're surprised that the interest level prom was very high with 77% interest. Um, they all wanted the prom. They were all very passionate about having one because they're interested that many went on to give us all kind of prom alternatives and prom ideas, different prom ideas, except for traditional prom. Um, and so again, we're like holding an event on the football field or having it just generally outdoors. So we have a lot of options to work with. We're going to continue to work with student council and some of the student class officers and advisors to plan that out um, for the students. So we're excited about that. So in your conversations with students about the prom, they're okay if they're not permitted to bring a date? or students okay? We didn't get into that with okay. the general rule, but I mean, that's what's going to end up being. So, I mean, unfortunately, we're going to have to focus on the senior class. You know, the juniors will get their prom next year. Um, the seniors with a limited number, um, you know, even at 70%, 77% of the kids attend the prom. Um, you know, we're going to have a, a really good turnout. So, and we don't know what the Commonwealth's capacity is going to be for now. Change. It could like we talked about, right? They go off, <laughs> and then we're, right. it opens up the whole you know, it opens yeah. up the juniors. So, right. or opens up the outside guests. So, that, I mean, that's the ever changing. Again, it's just like trying to hit that moving target and, and, and okay. plan. And our prom is later in the spring, correct? It's like Memorial Day weekend. It's that Memorial Day weekend. Okay. So we have time, definitely. All right. Um, so for um, graduation, uh, graduation will be held on June 16th. Um, we'll have rain dates for after that. Um, we're working on determining the location of format based on guidelines. Um, as we approach that date, um, I'm actually meeting with a sound company. It's supposed to be last Thursday, but of course I canceled to the weather on March 4th, I believe it is, um, to see the capacity of um, the sound we have in the, the stadium in case we need to hold it in the stadium wall. So the, the front of the school where the traditional commencement is held and you know, some of the sound set up there. So we're working through that process. And then on March 4th, we have a, a regional graduation summit for um, Chester County, um, Delaware County, and um, Montgomery County. So the principals, and we're going to get a group of we'll attend virtually students together. Um, we'll go through. Uh, We'll discuss ideas, have panelists, discussions, kind of bounce ideas off each other and get ideas of what other schools are doing and maybe help us plan for that. So that's on March 4th. So we're, we're moving forward with uh, with graduation. Spring homecoming and, and this Can is... Can we go back to graduation yeah. real quick? So just, just so everybody's aware, one of the challenges we're going to have, we'll have with graduation this year is it's an outdoor event which means we're going to have to plan for multiple rain dates. And I know that's going to frustrate people, right? You know, because usually the backup plan is to go in, we can go into the auditorium, set something up on the stage. I'm not sure if the Commonwealth's capacity limits won't allow us to do that this year. So um, we'll, we just want to make the board aware there's going to be multiple rain dates for graduation. And I know that's going to be frustrating, but it's going to be worth it in the end. We couldn't do an auditorium. Our auditorium is six feet social distance. Hold 140 people, and right? We're, we're way above that. Just then, yeah. we're going to be able to accommodate. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to be able to accommodate much more of our school community outside. And I have some thoughts on increasing the capacity. That's <laughs> conversation. Yeah, <laughs> conversation. Um, um, so uh, can, yeah. Yeah. 
can I just jump in quick? This is Matt. Um, have we looked at any venues that are inside that that uh, would have the capacity if if we did some kind of limiting tickets, uh, limiting attendance, and, and obviously there are a lot of issues with distance and percent capacity and whatnot. But rather as an option, rather than having so many rain dates, you know, is there a venue close by within reasonable driving distance that we could set a date so people could really plan for it? That could be, but yeah, I think you're still, yeah, it depends on the size, but then you're going into a cost factor of a facility that size. And again, I'm not 100% familiar with what would be in the area, uh, but you know, then you're looking at a cost factor there. Um, and I think if you rent that out, that has to be a date no matter what. Um, so you're taking away that June 16th outdoor date. Anybody have any thoughts? Because I mean, when I lived in South Central Pennsylvania, so um, Messiah College had a field house that the Kennesburg yeah. used. Um, just trying to think local university that has a field house that's within Un Unionville, Unionville gets, uh, they have their graduation at the University of Delaware. Yeah, so does Avon Grove. Chester University is another good one as well. Franklin and Marshall would be a good one, actually. And would our community be willing to travel? I think, we have a I, think, I think we'd have to pull the community to find out. Okay. Or pull the seniors. So University of Delaware, Westchester yeah, yeah. University. Mike's host or something? Yeah. For years? Was it? Yeah, the host. host? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just redid everything. I'm not sure what they did like that. It was the same, wasn't it? Lancaster, Lancaster host, host resort. Oh, we had a mention of Lincoln University. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that. Your That's picture pops close. up. Okay. Good thoughts. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll contact those folks, so. see what their capacity is. Lincoln's a close. Lost every option. And um, Tony Trainer just said the nook, which is big, big. spooky nook. Okay. Oh, yeah. My goodness. Like so there's five yeah. University of Delaware, Westchester University, Lancaster Hose, Lincoln University, and Spooky Nook. I was quite familiar with Rhode Island, too. Just probably just as far as the nook. What was that? The nook's probably the farthest out, I don't think, right? And uh, the right by this west. Yeah. Contact them now, see what the yeah, capacity is. Yeah, um, so for spring homecoming, we, we talked to student council um, regarding the spring homecoming, and overwhelmingly, um, the kids' um, general consensus was on the spring homecoming, seems that no one was really interested in that. Um, and they would rather push out the spirit week and all those other activities out towards the prom. Um, so I think maybe that's the way we move. Uh, we focus all that around the prom, making that a big celebration. Um, for that, I talked to Gato about Hall of Fame, though I think we should still push forward with Hall of Fame in the spring. Homecoming was a casualty of, of, of the pandemic there this year, but we'll, we'll get back to that next year. Um, so some other activities, again, musical, we are, we shared out musical, we have a I shared out last board meeting. Student council is coming, have to come up with lots of ideas of spirit days. So we'll be having those coming through here, um, through the year. This week is FFA week. Um, so we're, we're pushing for that. I, I knew it was this week, but I didn't pay attention to the day. I actually we're going gold, so it's perfect. I like I know what I'm doing there. Um, baccalaureate, I know Ms. Hardy's gonna, uh, Take the lead on that and graciously uh, accepted that again. Uh, National Honor Society, I'm working with the advisor. He's talking with the kids. We're going to pin down a couple of dates, whether it's one day or two days, based on the number and the tickets we can give out for National Honor Society ceremony. We'd like to do that in person. I'll work with the band and core, the choir teachers, um, to try and plan out um, some band and choir concert. Being a band parent myself, my son's a senior. I'm able to kind of get an idea of what they're doing, possibly doing for their spring concerts, and maybe share out his ideas with our with our teachers. Um, just in some other things, the newspaper, the advisor, uh, Mrs. Watson's continuing with that, and posted to the school um, kids 
class quality pages. Um, the senior award and best of class at the end of the year will begin planning the events and information that will be sent to the school community once we determine how they'll be held. We want to attempt to have everything as much in person as we possibly can and, and the best way to do that. And just some of the other activities, they came up with a bunch of great ideas because when they put out the poll of the senior class on what the end of the year activities they wanted, um, they had events such as a drive-in movie, an outside movie night in the stadium, uh, picnic at the park, a senior breakfast, a senior sunrise or sunset on day of celebration. So we have a ton of ideas um, here that are doable. Um, we're going to work with the kids and, and get those set up and give them some normalcy here as we get past the winter months and we're able to get some activities done. So we're excited. Um, again, this is, you know, it's exciting for us. We enjoy these events, so it's, 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 this is the, the real fun part of the job um, and work with them and plan this stuff out. So that's where we are with an update with on some of the school life activities. Yeah, I can I can say too, well, just because I've been hearing back and forth and all the ideas that kids have been coming up with. They, I mean, some of these ideas are so cool and original. It's mm -hmm. Just like the picnic one they were talking about on, you know, like the football field or something like that, or even making the prom a little more casual because they might spend so much money on the dress and stuff this time of year, and and just how they're bringing out in this some of these. I like the sunset. Yeah, that one. Yeah, uh, I just great. heard that one too, and that's just yeah. been. It got me really jazzed up and excited for the kids. Yeah, we're, we were excited. I mean, John, yeah. Proper sat in the meeting with the kids. We were really excited. We share with them a, a lot of this stuff, and then the, the, like we talk about what's our why, and we both share like our why is that last week leading up to the graduation and being with the kids and seeing the excitement and these types of activities. So we're looking forward to it, and you know, this this is the fun part of the job. The senior parade was also a big hit last year. Yeah, we took that. Okay. Yeah, we, they did mention that in the, in the meeting also. All right, we'll do some homework on those five locations yep. for possible commencement. And we'll share that with the board. Hey guys, can you hear me? It's Brian. I got a chance to get zoomed in. We even hear you. Yeah. Hey, uh, at the risk of um, upsetting a few people there, could, could someone give me a quick five second review of what I missed as far as the trimesters and some of the school improvement stuff, if you've gotten to that? No. <laughs> it was a pretty long discussion, Brian. Um, but the, I think um, we're, uh, we're going to go off. Um, Mike is going to go off and look at some other options from and, and value of why some of the schools went to that. Uh, some went to trimesters. We want to understand what the value of that is because we realize that it's a lot of work. Um, some have gone and then went back to quarters, uh, and we're, we're trying to understand uh, um, what some of the thinking is uh, that some of the other schools have gone through as they uh, looked at that. Um, but there was a, a clear uh, statement, I think uh, Dr. Ernie made it, that um, we will be evaluating a new master schedule to start September of next year. September, September 2022. September of 22, not 21. Correct. Correct. I, I, I don't know. Again, forgive me. I don't know what was covered, what wasn't. I distinctly remember being told last time, you know, obviously pre-pandemic, that, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Like, why? What? what, what we just throwing spaghetti noodles against the wall, see what sticks? Like, what? What? what is the, uh, what's taking so long? I mean, good grief. You know, we started off with just a, uh, you know, get, get kids in math class five days a week. That's what we were solving for. Now we're in trimesters, block schedule, and a year and a half, two years later than we were supposed to be. Uh, did I miss something? <laughs> no, that was it. That, no, that, you, what you're saying, I don't mean to make light of it, I'm sorry, but no, you, what you're saying is is very much the, the discussion that we had. Um, and- um, Okay, was it, done with, was it done with the same zing that I offered? <laughs> No, your your no. saying is uniquely you. Um, but we uh, missed you. <laughs> no, just the noodle part. Yeah, you. yeah. Um, but we, you know, we do have to acknowledge that uh, the pandemic did. I mean, it did set us back about a year. It was also uh, part of the 
um, rationale for uh, delays around school improvement and our ability to exit school improvement if some of the criteria is standardized testing that uh, we didn't get last year, we might not have this year. Okay, understood. And then the other question I had was, I, I have a, another distinct recollection of when we started trimesters in the, in the uh, elementary that we were told that it was not doable at the junior senior high level for a myriad of reasons. Now, all of a sudden, post pandemic or soon to be post pandemic, it's, uh, it's a direction we wanna do. So again, could someone please enlighten me on the, sh the, the course shifting there? Like what happened? I think what we're doing, Brian, is we're looking at every possible option we have to solve for the myriad of challenges that we have in the junior senior high and, and ultimately coming up with the package that ensures success for the greatest number of kids. I wasn't superintendent of the school district when the trimester conversation occurred K to six. Um, but I felt it was worth our time to take a look at since the since COVID-19 had put us behind and put us back into this planning phase of what the schedule should look like at the junior senior high, I thought it was worth adding that piece to the conversation. It doesn't mean that's where we're going to head, right? And when we bring the master schedule conversation back to the board here in a month or two, um, we can pick up where we left off. All right. Now, our, in your opinion, we have time for this uh, sort of treading water while we uh, get our act together? I believe that we do, and, and I, I know um, what we're trying to do as an administration is to uh, ensure success for the greatest number of kids. That's, that's what we're charged with. We're charged with student success for all kids, and that requires us to look at every option, every option. Okay, great. Now, now, now my other concern is I, I don't know whether the staff is as blindsided as we are with this discussion. Hopefully not. I'm wondering what your uh, uh, thoughts are on the staff's uh, opinion of such a, a drastic shift in, uh, in course. And Mike's been having conversations with the leadership of our professional learning communities for the last month. So, so they are aware and, and they've had a voice in this process. We're at the very, very beginning. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, sure, K-12 summer program planning update, Dr. Tenno. Thanks, Mike. All right, so let's talk summer. Yes. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I shared with you the, the interest data um, from the, the K to six parents um, regarding uh, regarding summer programming and, and how much they were interested in. Our, our, our goal has been to look at our, our current summer programming that we've done, the traditional summer literacy and math program K to six, and our extended school year program that spans K to 12, and look at ways in which we could expand expanded this year to offer multiple opportunities for students to catch up and, and, and begin to work on, on closing some of those, those gaps that have been caused by the pandemic and um, everything that we've gone through since last March. And it's hard to believe it's coming up on a year since then. So as promised, I did share with you ahead of time the secondary survey data. We surveyed students, parents, and, and teachers regarding their interest in summer programming. Um, not surprisingly, it, there's less interest at the secondary level than there was at the elementary level. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at, we surveyed um, folks about uh, tutoring. We surveyed folks at the secondary level about some, some summer camp-like activities, SAT prep, uh, college essay writing, those types of things. We didn't get a, a good response for all of those. Um, so based on the data, uh, we made uh, based 
uh, we made a decision to really put out um, um, an interest form that, that was asking teachers to commit more to um, their availability for one-on-one -on -one and small group tutoring at the secondary level. There really wasn't enough interest from the teachers um, to look at offering um, camp-like activities such as the SAT prep and coding and computer science. Um, <clears throat> so a Google form was sent to all 7th to 12th staff on Monday the 15th to determine how many teachers we might have who are willing to commit to um, offering some tutoring uh, and in what subjects this summer. Um, again, we concluded that there wasn't enough interest to pursue 7th through 12th enrichment activities, so we did nothing on that. And then also on Monday, we sent uh, out to staff K-12 the uh, summer um, literacy and math teacher and support staff interest form. And this is for what we were envisioning as the ideal, an eight-week summer literacy and math program and a form um, for teachers to submit a proposal to facilitate an elementary summer afternoon camp session. So what we were envisioning initially was at the elementary level to be able to offer, and this is in the proposal that um, Mr. Curtis and I worked on for you, um, to be able to offer um, the morning academics for incoming kindergartners through grade six, students who had finished grade six, so the morning academics, which would be literacy, math, and science, and then in the afternoon, um, students could have lunch and then go to a camp activity that may span one week, two weeks, or four weeks, depending on the camp. Um, uh, we've, we've done legwork to look into busing um, in the morning, midday, for, for parents who didn't want their students to spend the entire day on campus, and then also at the end of the afternoon session. Uh, so we, we have those those uh, those costs there for you in the proposed summer programming that I sent to you. You also have what has been our traditional summer programming and the costs laid out there, um, which includes um, extended school year as well. So I told you I shared with you some of the responses that we got from staff because the big question is, can what can we staff? Right? What are we going to be able to staff? So um, as of today, and the application is all closed today, um, as of today for our incoming K to 6 summer literacy math and science program, we have a total of 27 applications. Typically we run, run it, we're able to run it with about 20, 21 teachers and 10 support staff. 14 of those indicated they could do all eight weeks. 13 indicated session one only, and there was no one for session two only. So that concerns me because I, I worry that we're not going to be able to staff the second four weeks of an eight-week program. Instructional assistance, we had 14 applications, 11 of which were all eight weeks. Uh, two were session one only, and one was session two only. And then for the, the PM camp, summer camp proposals, we had 11 applications. Six of those were for all eight weeks, three were session one only, and two were session two. So um, at the elementary level then, um, that's the big question. Um, do we go outside? Do we advertise outside to see if we can hire so we have a, a more reasonable assurance that we're going to be able to staff a full A and PM eight week program? Or do we go back to our original five-week program, um, um, K-6, include the, the, the afternoon activities, but have them be separate from an inclusive full-day program. So, so looking for some direction here tonight um, and some discussion and, and you know, next steps to take. Um, because as we get later in the school year, um, Usually our timeline is, is such that we've already gotten some registration forms out to parents and things like that. So I know my co-directors are getting a little nervous. Um, <clears throat> at the secondary level, uh, I, I think we can go ahead and offer tutoring opportunities, so free tutoring for students, either one-on-one -on -one or small group. We had three math teachers who were willing to tutor. We have two English language arts. We have one English learner. 
teacher and one social studies teacher who are, who are willing to tutor. So I think that, you know, given that that um, we have several of those teachers willing to be flexible with when they can during that, that initial eight week time period, I think we could go ahead and, ahead and advertise that and, and see how many parents and students want to take us up on a, a tutoring opportunity for free. We know, um, we know how many kids, well, let's say a, a student's failing uh, uh, biology. Mm -hmm. would, would they be able to take the one-on-one -on -one tutoring for science for the summer with a focused um, piece on the gaps so that they could get credit for the class? No, it wouldn't count towards credit recovery because it would, it would have to be an actual course. Okay. So it would not count. So, so for a student who has failed a course, right. we give them the option to take the OVA course. Right. Um, we've also discussed um, 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 providing supports for students during the summer who are taking credit recovery courses. So instead of just say, you know, sign up for this credit recovery course, um, you know, have at it, here's your due date. Um, we provide an option a couple of days a week to come in and meet with meet with the facilitator. Yeah. Um, you know, such like our OBA. Like we do during the yeah, like school year. Yeah. Um, in the past, we have asked our, our, our students who need credit recovery courses to pay for those. Um, we've had some conversation about offering those for free. Then we have conversation about having students pay for them up front and then reimbursing them upon successful completion. Um, to avoid the, the um, you know, I didn't pay for this. If I blow it off, I just have to take biology right. again skin, next year. Skin in the game. And, and we're paying for it, right? So, so those have been the conversations around credit recovery. So we're thinking an eight week summer program is I, too long. I think it, I don't think we're going to be able to staff it yeah. unless we go outside of the school district. And there are, are pros and cons to that. We may be able to find some, you know, long-term subs that have been working in other districts that want to keep working during the summer. We may be able to find, you know, some teachers that have just graduated and are newly certified that will be willing to work. One of the advantages of using our teachers is they know our curriculum and they know our kids. And so there, there, there's less professional development we have to do to them on the outset and they can kind of pick up where they've left off and, and, and really meet kids, um, you know, where they are. Um, typically we only have, we don't have any more than, than eight, eight, maybe 10 in a higher group of kids in a, in a literacy group or a math group. So there's, there's, you know, social distancing probably won't be an issue and we can also um, you know, provide more individualized instruction have over we, the summer to help help address some of those gaps. Have we gone outside before? We have never gone outside. For summer, we always have enough. We always have enough in house, and I, I believe we will have enough in house to staff a five week program. Yeah, sure. Yeah. In in your in the five week program, in your experience, do the those participation rates drop off as as the summer progresses? We've always had, had a, a, a mixture of students who, who attend for all five weeks, some attend for four weeks because they have a vacation plan. You know, there's always the ones that, that you know, say they'll come and then it's very sporadic. We have some of the same attendance issues in the summer that we, we do during the school year. Oftentimes there are end of year conferences with principals and, um, you know, instructional support teachers. Um, regarding students who have not attended and, and you know, it's discussed that if they come and they attend, have to have 90% attendance during the five week summer program, then they can be promoted to the next year. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit all over the place, to be honest, Lisa. And I know, I know in the past that, that Lisa Welsh and Joanna Bowder, they're all over the attendance, they're calling parents, they're, they're, they're doing whatever they can. I know we've even made some home visits in the past that I've been involved in to try and get kids who really need to be here here. Okay, that because that was the, and I know we talked a little bit about it last time as, as far as, you know, who is your target audience? Um, I know that you talked about the rationale is to recoup some of the losses um, that we've had this year. So I guess who, who is your target audience? How do you plan 
to reach out to those students and from going to five to eight weeks, are you, what are you really solving for that you think that those three weeks would provide that much difference um, to, to do that, to have to bring in you know, outside people? Sure, sure. I don't know how much difference it would, it would, it would make. Um, we were looking at expanding it just to provide a little bit more consistency throughout the summer and maybe give parents some more flexibility to get more participation. So if parents wanted to just have their child attend the first four weeks or the last four weeks, they would have that flexibility and maybe we, would, we could get more students attending. Um, um, that was that was largely the thinking behind the eight weeks, um, but at the end of the day, it's better to have a student here for five weeks than it is for four weeks. And as far as who we're targeting, we're always targeting those students who, who are struggling, those students who do not qualify for extended school year programming, and that's if they have an IEP and meet certain criteria. Um, it's those students who are getting reading support, who are struggling in math, and you know those recommendations you know go out to parents, um, from teachers, and uh, uh, you know in the past we've made made phone calls home recommending it. Principals have been recommending it to parents um, as we're meeting with students and parents, um, you know, throughout the, the the winter and the spring and leading up to the summer. So, and again, though, I, I, I feel like I need to say a five-week summer literacy and math and science program is not going to close everybody's gaps. It, it, it's not a, a, a magic solution to, to solving what we lost with COVID. What it would do is it will maybe help some, many students maintain where they are and also gain some ground. But um, there, there, I don't believe there's a, a quick fix to closing all the achievement gap that's been caused by COVID. That's something that we're going to have to be addressing um, throughout next school year and, and how we're looking at curriculum and how we can, can um, move towards personalizing learning and providing more intervention for more students so that we can continue to work to close those gaps while at the same time providing grade level curriculum and instruction. Thank you. And, and you know, and I do understand that, that you're not suggesting that in five or eight weeks, we're going to close all the gaps. So yeah, I, I totally understand um, what you mean. Uh, <laughs> um, so Dr. Tao, within those five weeks, maybe there, you know, eight weeks might be more than, than our community wants or we can staff this year. Well, when I but, went back and I looked, you know, first of all, the staffing is, is the major concern. I don't want to promise something that I can't deliver. Right. And number two, when I went back to look at the parent interest survey data for the elementary, um, that the, the, the highest um, number of responses were for that five week half day program. So we had, we had, a, yeah, we had 23 for the eight week full day, 17 for an eight week half day, and then 45 for a five week half day program. So, so maybe there's an opportunity to stick with the traditional five week program that we've offered, but look at some other things that we might be able to add to the five weeks, like well, the camps so, or so the yes. tutoring. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that, you know, we, we, we had some teachers submit some great proposal for summer camp enrichment activities K through six. We've got good food and good cooking. We've got nature nuggets. We've got wrestling camp. We've got soccer camp. We've got Spanish. We've got Glory of Stories, Exploring Art and Art History through Storybooks. We've got Exploring Art Mediums. We've got Ukulele, um, Softball Camp, and then we've got um, Escape Rooms in STEM. So I think, you know, those are some things that we can still offer. Um, they would be run by teachers, but we, the district would own them versus in the past, remember when we did some of that policy work about staff use of facilities. So the, the, the district would pay the teachers to run them we would provide whatever funding they need for supplies, um, but um, you know we would work with that that facilitator to determine the length of the camp, you know, and we would we would advertise it for them, and work and manage the registrations and all of that. The big question is is are we going to? And my recommendation is to offer it, you know, we either maybe offer it over that five week period in the afternoons, or maybe we offer it. 
you know, um, maybe there's stuff we can sprinkle in after those five weeks are over to maybe reach more kids. I don't know. Would you but, require uh, morning attendance in order to take the afternoon camp? Uh, yeah. Is there I a good way to get out of transportation? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think we get a lot of pushback from parents on that. I think there are some parents based on the survey data that just didn't want their kids to do enrichment stuff this summer because their years have been such a struggle. Yeah. Um, so if we say you have to attend the morning, in order to attend an afternoon camp. It's not what they signed up for. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but that's the question then. Do, do we want to include those afternoon enrichment activities as part of a full day program that we run, um, you know, 8, 8.30 to yeah. 3 or 3.30? The reason I'm asking is, um, like, we're, we're funding this through taxpayer dollars, right? So I, I'm not sure that it would be the right use of public funds to provide interest camps in the afternoons, what, which would have normally been paid for by the families that took advantage of it. Yeah. That was, is, am I reading that right? We were going to use the grant. We were going to use, yeah, we were going to use the, the, the SO2 funding. Well, it's still public money, though. Right. It's, 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 it came out of your federal tax instead of yours. State right. tax, right? So we were so so say that again because I'm not I'm not understanding fully what you're asking. If like so where where I was thinking is if it's publicly funded, mm -hmm. then what I'm trying to do is close achievement gaps. Not fully, but somewhat, right? I understand. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to provide the summer experience for those kids that have signed up for my enrichment in the morning. I think it's more palatable to say in the afternoon we're going to provide them with this other experience as part of that overall program. Mm -hmm. Then I would pay for it. Exactly. You see what I mean? I see your point. But but if it's but if it's um, just an enrichment camp. If it's just an enrichment camp, you can have 1,200 kids that want to do something. You, 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 it's 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 free camp. These are mm -hmm. free camps. Mm -hmm. And. And I would, I'd rather see it as part of an educational mm -hmm. piece than public, publicly funded. So the, the options then would be either half day academics in the morning or full day academics in Richmond. Yeah, so or, it would be yeah, or, academic in the morning and a camp in the afternoon. Yeah, and then if, if teachers want to do the camp, the old style, you could still do that, but it would have to be outside those five weeks because otherwise, I think you're going to have a scheduling right. nightmare. Well, I don't want any conflicts with you. Yeah, yeah, you can have a conflict. Right, right. Okay. There it is. Is there other thoughts? I know, hey guys, you know, one of the things I think, I think Elaine is finding mm -hmm. is what she's up against is while this is uh, certainly much needed and the intentions are noble, uh, I remember that very first snow day when. Both staff and families and kids got a chance to just relish the fact that they, they got a, a respite from it all. And I think what we're seeing is everyone knows that this is probably a necessary thing, but I think there's just screen fatigue, there's COVID fatigue, there's the anticipation that by summertime there's going to be vacations, it's going to be a return to somewhat normalcy. And I think people are afraid to jump into something and commit to that extended school because essentially you'd have a week before school or a week after our schools and two weeks before the next year starts and I just think it's too much to ask for the eight week thing and even some of it scaled back I think you're, you're seeing a hesitancy again it's just a chance to take a breath and and you know enjoy the summer so I think that's going to be an uphill battle for us Thanks, Brian. You got that exactly right. I, I, that is what we're struggling with. But five weeks is doable. Yeah. So focus on the five weeks. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. I go back to what Tony said earlier. Let's let's concentrate on what we can do and what and do it well versus try to expand things right now. Especially if you don't have the staffing, it doesn't appear you've got the interest. 
Um, but I also think Brian Fox had a really good point as far as um, the afternoon activities. And I think back when those afternoon activities, when some of those were after school activities and um, parents were able to, to provide um, the funding for that themselves. There was never, didn't appear that there were problems of filling some of those um, clubs, mm -hmm. say clubs, you know, activities. So I would just be cautious how much we open up on the public's dime. Thank you. I, I think there's some value as a taxpayer. I think there's value in those programs if they're part of a full day. It's kind of like a gym class, right? I, and and I, whoever might be running those camps, I don't mean to like it, it, that's offensive. I didn't mean that at all. But but it, it's just you know part of a part of a school day, and it's an enrichment activity part of the school day. All right. Seven to, sorry, seven to twelve. That's a, that's a toughie because um, I, I you know, what's what's our latest uh, number of students that are failing at least one subject? It was twelve percent or something last time we talked. Or, uh, eight or yeah, so it's floating around like it's a tenth, right? So so you know there there are choices. So for students who are failing courses, they can fail the course and just retake it next year. Um, right. They can they can. Um, Take an OBA credit recovery course. So those are their two options if they actually fail a course. But if they feel like they limped by this year and they they want some tutoring so that they can can have a little easier time in an eighth grade math next year, for example, then you know that that according to what the data I got, that's something that we could provide. It's up to the board whether or not we want to provide that, use our, our investor funding to provide that. That would be at $30 an hour for teaching. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's just really cheap for tutoring. Yeah, I really agree. I think tutoring is something definitely we should be offering just to give kids. I mean, there could be kids out there that are really good students but just struggle with online mm -hmm. and they want to stay abreast and you know, keep going and stuff like that. I think it's something we really should offer. Yeah. Can we do it now? Like, I feel more of a sense of urgency for 7 to 12. Well, the problem with doing it now is our teachers are, are working their butts off trying to they're teach tech. their regular load yeah, and, and to provide tutoring on top of that. Um, you know, and I'm sure they're helping kids as much as they can and, and, and working with them there. And, you know, so I, I think that that we're not going to get many takers for, for our teachers who want to tutor. Right now, and kids too, because they don't want to come out of the school. Yeah, is there? I'm not sure how this is even possible or something, just because everything is Zoom and all that. Is there any way that maybe if some the older kids want to sign up for like a mentoring program or something, maybe they want to help some of the younger kids out? You know, some you know gives somebody like a ninth grader can call a senior and say, "Hey, I just got a question, or can you help me out?" or is there like something like that we could like just throw out there as any seniors, juniors, or something like that willing to be like a mentor, like the like you mean, you seventh like, or eighth or or, or any tutor? You mean like yeah. a hero? Yeah, like a hero or something like that. To just hey, you know, is anybody willing to step up and maybe help answer some questions? Trust me, as a parent, a lot of these classes. Most of the math and the geometry, yeah, exactly. all that is way over my head. Yeah, exactly. So it'd be nice that there was like a list or something like that. that well, that's, that, that's something that, you know, maybe Mr. Brooks would discuss with, with, you know, city council and, you know, maybe right. national honor society. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. you want to be cognizant. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I was thinking that too. Like, could you have a bank of students that, you know, would be interested in that? Because I know years ago, my daughter, Tutored, tutored someone you know that we knew that are, that are uh, you know friends of ours and they were like hey you know would she be willing to help and she did of course they you know they paid her but you know if you have like a bank of students wanting to do something like that and I like the idea of like the whole question you know like here have have these hours open for kids to you know ask questions of those that are there to help them yeah, it would be interesting to see how many students would actually take advantage of that. On both sides. 
Mm -hmm. Right, the ones that, I mean, you might have kids that would want to. Right, and I think that we have to also be cognizant of, of, you know, this isn't a normal year, so our juniors and seniors are struggling just as much as everybody else. Um, and oftentimes our, our, our high performing kids are also super involved, they're working, they, you know, have a lot going on, very little free time. So that's not to say there wouldn't be anybody that would be interested in doing that, especially maybe some of these kids who are interested in pursuing education maybe. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth investigating. I think it would be a very good um, activity to have on a college application. Uh -huh. You were to yep, it'd be a community service for a graduation requirement for sure. And you just sign off on that, and uh, they fall right in line to you know National Honor Society. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, it might not have to be as much as even a tutor as a homework helper or it could just be somebody just to bounce a, questions a off of. Yeah. 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 or something so yeah. people could pop in and ask questions or you know. So just so I'm clear, moving forward with summer. Um, five weeks, correct? For five weeks, um, we're going to offer five weeks, either just the AM academics or the AM academics and the enrichment activity. There's no just enrichment activity option. Well, the issue with the new with the just enrichment is who pays for with the taxpayer money? Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I'd love to have all that stuff, but I just feel like, why is the taxpayer paying? Yeah, it's play for. Okay, so people. it's an extension of <laughs> the child's day if they're enrolled in the more they academic want a, program. A more helpful day option. It's fine. Yeah. You run like three different afternoon options. Okay. Right? You run three different camps. You do your you do your literacy, math, ESL, whatever you're doing in the morning. And then you have these three options in the afternoon. Oh yeah, that's definitely doable. Yeah. That, that's that's doable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And the two and the tutoring for the junior senior high, the tutoring program, we're free to move ahead with that. Yeah, that was the if we can put that, that in place. That was the bargain. Right? Okay. That's the bargain. Okay. And, um, and teachers want to do an enrichment camp outside those five weeks. That's still fair game, right? Right. And, they, so, they, 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 and that's a that's a that's a parent funded. Well, we're going to have to talk about the state use of facility right. policy and that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Who are they paying? Are they going to pay the district or the teacher? It depends on how they're going to. <coughs> we're going to pay the teacher to do it, and then the parents paying the district. That's one thing. But if the teacher wants to act as a as a independent contractor, contractor yeah. then they will have to. You know, there's liability there as well. But I would caution against. There's the ability for them to rent the facility and do that. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, just the first look at the district calendar for the 21-22 school year. Um, you'll notice the first day on this proposed calendar is before Labor Day. So we would go back to that traditional before Labor Day starts. So August 30th would be the first student day. Um, the last student day would be June 2nd. So graduation would be the 2nd of June. Uh, one piece of the calendar that we currently have not solved for yet, and Michael Brooks is working with the leaders of the PLC in the junior senior high, and that is what parent conferences are gonna look like in the spring. Um, for next year. Next year, right. Fall and spring. For fall and spring. Right. He's taking this as an opportunity to have a conversation with his staff about how we can begin to maximize attendance at parent conferences 7 through 12. Right. Over the past few years, we've seen a decrease in the number of parents who are taking advantage of those parent conferencing opportunities in the fall and the spring. And Mike has been having conversations with his staff about how we can make better use of that time. Right. So that's a piece of what's missing from uh, the calendar you see before you. Um, but when we do bring this back to the board on March 15th, I guess would be the second meeting of the month, um, we would have an update for you. Also, just keep in there. mind, the highlighted is last year's, this year's back to school dates. I have an email out to principals to give me new dates with us going back to the week earlier starts in this year. So 
So that's why that's highlighted because those are this current year's fees. Um, and in talking with my superintendent colleagues in Chester and Lancaster County, um, everybody's going back to that traditional before Labor Day start. And is it June 8th or June 2nd? June 2nd. It's June 8th. Oh, I'm sorry, June 8th. June 3rd is a is a clerical That's correct. day at the end of the marking period right. that the teachers get, and then yeah. it's three half days the following week. You are correct. So 6th, 7th, so 8th would be the last day, and in that would be commencement. Day. Right. I bring up some uh, teacher conferences. Um, sure, for really, all years. Yeah. yeah, I really, I don't know how to use, because I mean, it's a lot to throw on the teachers and stuff like that to try to get all the kids in. But it's just a 15 minute block and you're just running nice. back and forth. And it just sometimes 15 minutes don't even seem like even enough time Absolutely. even to talk to teachers. But I just would hate to see them there four nights a week or something like that. It's just, I mean, it's a lot to put on, but it just seems like at 15 minutes, it's boom, 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 you barely get to right. get to discuss really anything or really get down into it. And then you're flying back and forth between the teachers. Um, is there is there a possible combination of a Zoom? I was just going to say. Zoom and an in-person right. option. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, I think take, you know, take the uh, opportunity to learn from the pandemic and continue a lot of this zooming option for a lot for for you know where it's feasible because um that can make it a heck of a lot easier for people to attend too i would think actually and i know that's something that mike is talking with his team about like him learn from COVID 19 and the google hangout and the zoom room. um boy that really makes parent conferencing easy right parents don't mm -hmm. have to home they don't have to come into school right and you can be more efficient and see more parents of time and have more meaningful conversations in a Zoom room or a Google Hangout. So that's one of the topics for the DLC leaders to discuss tomorrow in the DLC meetings and to provide feedback to you because they kind of what their so, thoughts are. Yeah, that way both parents can come and you're not worried about watching the kids because yep. you're not supposed to bring the kids along. You can bring the kid with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I so. think I think if you pulled the parents, I think they would say that they would rather do the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Still okay. have some in person options. Like sure. Sure. They like to come in so staff could zoom from here and, and accommodate those parents who actually want to come into the school. But we got the feeling though that K to six parents are still going to want that traditional elementary experience of coming into the classroom yeah, and seeing their child's work. Yeah. And yeah. And so Zoom's not bad when you're not on it all day long. Absolutely. Oh Sorry. yeah, it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> <that's> still, yeah. <laughs> so, um, K to 12, mental health town hall. I know Cal Hill Bowl. Can I, can I oh, interrupt oh. real quick? Yep, who's talking? Uh, Lisa, Lisa Bowman. Can I interrupt real quick? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, be before we move on, I just had a quick question about, real quick, about the summer program because you're talking about funding it for the next two summers with the grant money, with the ESSER funding, would it be would it be better to just commit to one summer and see how it goes before we commit the funding, even though it's a grant for the, that we don't commit for two summers? Sure, we can take it one summer at a time. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just saw that. I just wanted to clarify that. All right, thank you. Hey, and guys, while we're, revisiting subjects we already talked about uh going back to the calendar um one of the things that i, I know I, I don't think i heard addressed was uh, despite the four snow days built in i'm i'm guessing that we will be applying for the uh uh extended well i can't think of it, the rfp or rfi days or whatever they are again instructional uh, I'm actually, there is a work group west of here. Um, there are several Lancaster County superintendents who are applying for FID days for next year. And um, I've joined their work group. Uh, and we get started here in, in a week or two um, to dust off. Um, these are school districts that have attempted to apply for the flexible instructional days. And um, their application to the Pennsylvania Department of Education wasn't approved. So there's a group of four or five of us that are working together as a team 
um, to see if we can correct each other's uh, mistakes and um, to see if we can apply for those good days. All right, so, that's that's good. I mean, hopefully this year was a, an anomaly, you know, winter wise, but it's always nice to have them in your back pocket, uh, particularly with a year of virtual uh, experience under our, uh, under our belt. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Um, K-12 Mental Health Town Hall. I don't know if Dr. Tahal and Mr. Hillbold have an update. I know they were working on some things. Sure. Um, it's, it's early, but um, we have um, determined that it would be a very good idea for our community if we could offer a K-12 Mental Health Town Hall um, with a keynote speaker and then just a you know, we, we do have a lot of mental health resources that are on our website that our counselors push out or school nurses have, but to just bring it all back to one place and to share out what some of those resources are, how to access some of those resources. Um, Kale and I are actually meeting tomorrow to, to really um, dig in and determine what the, the actual, what we want the focus to be for the keynote speaker, who that might be. We're gonna get some input from school nurses but um, it, 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 it's been a rough year, as everybody knows. And, and you know, we talk a lot about student achievement and um, students can achieve when they have a lot of, lot of um, mental health barriers and, and um, the, the stress levels just have been through the roof for, for everybody, every stakeholder group this year. So we thought it might be a good idea to, to provide that to our community and um, at least begin a conversation. Um, so that people know where to go and they need help. Um, if you could record it, it would be good. I think yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So more to come on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa McNamara is with us tonight. She's a NACI exam update, and I know she has sent you an extensive uh, written update as to the conversations that she's currently having with her staff and, and the Bureau of Career and Technical Education. So, um, Lisa Mack, if you're on. Sure. Um, over the past few months, I've been communicating with many comprehensive high schools throughout Pennsylvania that have in-house career and technical education programs about the growing concern about whether or not the National Occupational Competency Testing Institute Assessment which you, I think everybody knows is NOCTI should be given. There are several major concerns being discussed across Pennsylvania in schools. Um, and that is obviously um, the different varieties of house, you know, comprehensive high schools and CTE centers are giving career and technical education programs. There are some schools that have been in school five days a week, uh, all year. Um, there are schools that are in hybrid that have been in school since August and has no real interruptions. And then there's been a lot of schools that are in the hybrid situation where students only come, you know, two times a week and then have had interruptions in the year. So obviously this has made a big dent in the hours that the students can get not only in their theory, but in the practical training. So at this time, OACTEP has not made a decision as to give the NACTI assessment. And um, on February 16th, the PA Department of Career and Technical Ed put out a NACTI test waiver application. If OACTEP does not does decide not to give the NACTI, we would have to complete the waiver application by April 5th and the um, school board would need to approve that. So for the past few weeks, I have been gathering data, as you can see, to help weigh the pros and the cons as to not giving the NACTI or to give the NACTI. At this time, you know, I'm really undecided, but lean a little bit towards offering the opportunity to students to opt to take the NACTI or not giving the NACTI. Um, as the data, you know, I have provided you shows there are significant, several significant reasons for this. Um, Number one, the biggest is the lack of instructional in-person hours that our career and technical education students have had and the significant amount of time that they missed when we went out um, at last year. And, you know, I, I thought it made it a little lengthy for you, but I added all the teachers' comments so that you could really see the true meaning behind the rationale. 
you know, at this point, you know, the comprehensive high schools that have opted out of taking NACD around us locally more so is um, the JP McCaskey High School campus in the school district of Lancaster has opted out of taking it. Carlisle's high school career and tech programs have opted out. And right now Pottstown is still undecided. They go back and forth. So I wanted to bring this to your attention, maybe to get your input um, and your thoughts. Um, the issue that we stand by is that in order for a student to be recognized by the state to be a completer, they have to take the NACTI. So if a student is in a program for three years and doesn't take the NACTI, then they don't get the, the completion certification from the state. So, um, and as well as the district doesn't get, um, you know, that certificate in the PIMS. Uh, as, so, you know, we've been really looking at it. I'm struggling. Dr. Orner and I have had conversations. I'm still having conversations with other school districts and wanted to give this input to you and see um, and maybe get some of your input. One thing that Lisa McNamara and I talked about today is that our parents have a choice to opt their child out of the PSSA and the Keystone exam. You know, should this be a year where we're putting it in to the hands of, of the parents and the students that we serve and say, look, if taking this test meets your career goals and you feel like with help from us, you can be successful on this test, um, you know, given the challenges that we've had, especially being out last spring, um, the disruption to the schedule this year, then we're here to support you, right? That, that was something that, that Lisa and I talked about today. Our parents have a choice with the PSSA and the Keystone exam. Shouldn't we be affording our parents and our students the same choice this year, given what a struggle it's been to get our students in class to practice the skills and you know some of the concerns that our staff has, but we certainly do not want to deny a student the opportunity to take the test. Yeah, I, this is where I was going. It's kind of like you're, you know, it's the reverse of the right? piece yeah. to say yeah. in the yeah. piece. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. You're going to have right. students that that can probably pass the test before they started taking the class. That, I was exactly. Really by program. Yeah, right. Kids because of their know. passion. Right. Yeah. You have career. kids that are so gifted with that that they could just probably pass the test on day one. Right. Yeah, I think well, it's, it's funny how the state doesn't give us real clear guidelines. Michelle and I kind of laughed about this. So you could either opt out of it totally, you can have some programs opt out of it and some programs take it. But then when we discuss the option of, well, can they individuals opt to take it? Just like what we're saying now, and the state was very unclear about that. So Michelle and I are trying to decipher that. Um, but we're thinking since it's a local decision and it's based on our policy, we think that it would work. Yeah, so, I totally agree. I think uh, yeah. I really think it's something we, because uh, some kids might need it for the future, for their advancement, for if yep. they're going to take it to the next level, yeah. you know, they'll need it. Some might not need it. Yeah. So I definitely think it's, we should be just saying this should be a decision left up to the parents and students. Are we, if we if we offer the NACTI exam, are we forcing something on students? What if we're saying that everybody needs to take it? Well, is that what we're doing? No, I mean each year all the seniors every usually every year have to take this assessment. I mean this is something that we do year after year. The, the issue that it is now, Brian, is because of the lack of hours and, you know, um, really how well the students are doing because they just haven't received all the curriculum. They just, they haven't received all the curriculum. And that NACTI, that NACTI test is based on a three year or actually two years in the program. We're able to come back five days a week soon. That's yeah. going to be an opportunity, right? That would be, yes. That would be an opportunity. What's TCHS doing? TCHS is giving the NACD this year, correct, Lisa? Yes, they've been in school since August. So they've had more of that consistency with the programs. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I talked to Brian Wilson and you know, or Ron Wilson about this. And, you know, like I said, a lot of other principals and everybody's torn about it because 
you know, we just want the students to be feel successful. And if they don't do well in the NACTI, you know, that's not, it, it's just a hard, a hard question to answer, but I agree. I, I'm kind of leaning on that way where we give this, the students and parents the opportunity to opt to take it. But again, okay. if we're going back more, who knows, it might be better. At least we have until April 5th. It does make sense though to give them the opportunity to make that choice. I would, I would hate to see a student that is prepared, ready, or even is going to an instructor asking for additional help wants to do this and then we would deny that person. It seems almost deny yeah. someone yes. um, yeah. the opportunity if you can go ahead and do it. Yeah, agree. And the teachers, I, I put in a chart there, they, you know, the majority of the teachers agree to that as well. I appreciate all the information you put together, Lisa, including the comments from the staff and, and the charts. Along with all the other industry certifications our kids have earned. Yeah. So. The one good thing is everybody's walking out with that OSHA. Um, that was a big success and, and a lot of the other certifications the students have walked out with. But. Programs and I think about kids who are gonna be able to take the NACTI, I do have concerns about the child care group because they haven't been able to run that preschool since last yeah, year. So right, so um, it, it's gonna be almost impossible unless that senior has an experience at a daycare center in the area. Um, we haven't been able to get our room to bloom up. Now, although Lisa tells me though, the instructor has a scenario she wants to try, correct? Yeah, she came to me the other um, last week or the week before and asked, you know, if, if she could start pursuing, pursuing bringing some of the students in. So Michelle and I had that conversation that we might be able to make that work. And so that would definitely help. Yeah, like a smaller version of room to bloom up the kids can begin to practice their skills. Hey, Lisa Mack, real quick, uh, on, on the list of uh, activities that uh, Mike put together, uh, I didn't see OA best, and I'm just wondering uh, uh, district-wide what, what anybody's thoughts were on that, the possibility of doing that again this spring. Yeah, Brian, we did meet as a committee, and honestly, I just put the email out to all of the OA um, C, or OA best participants today that we felt that one more year of just holding off um, for such a big event because the, that one year we had over two thousand people attend, and it just wouldn't meet that the state criteria, um, and you know, with something like that, so we just felt it best to hold off one more year and then make. 2022 one big great event better than ever yep okay great thanks thank you and you know you're gonna have to come out and cook oh uh, you know i'll be there all right <laughs> <laughs> we um we don't have a uh, piece for public comment in this meeting but there is somebody that raised their hand i just pinged her um, it's related to the NACTI topic. Are you guys okay if I unmute a line? Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah. It'd be nice to hear from everyone. Okay. So, uh, Tracy, I'm just going to unmute your line. Uh, oh, hold on. Tracy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, we can hear you. Can you just um, introduce yourself and where are you, what your uh, municipality is, where you live? Yes, I'm, I apologize, I was losing my voice, so sorry. Um, I'm Tracy Wickhart, and I live in West Fallowfield Township. Thank you. And I do have a question, well, on the NACTI test that Lisa was just talking about. So my daughter's in the graphic design and has been for the three years. Um, if they don't make them take the test, but it's an option, I mean, does it really hurt them if, I mean, should they just try? And even if they don't pass it for some reason, does it go against them or anything? Like out in the real world or through college or whatever? Should they just try anyway? Or, or no. not try if they think they wouldn't pass it? Well, that's another dilemma. When we look at, um, you know, we say in order for them to, for the state to give them that completer certification, they have to take it. 
Now, if they got basic in both the written and the practical, then they still are considered a completer. However, then they have a certificate that's kind of, you know, when they look at the score for what they had in the NACTI, if, if a college or a certification or an employer wants to see what they received, then they see a basic. So it's just a double-edged sword here. Um, you know, I, I have the utmost confidence in our students because, you know, like I think, um, you know, it was said that some of these students, you know, they, they love what they're doing. And, you know, so we should give them that opportunity to do that. You know, there was another conversation, you know, um, where I had with another um, director and they said, well, you know, can we make our own certificate? And then if the college needs us to sign off on something, but you know, these are all things that are up in the air and it's all unknown. And, you know, so that's why I like the thought of having the students opt to take it. I agree. I mean, I would definitely want her to take it. Mm -hmm. And I, she does well in that program anyway. I mean, I feel she would pass, yeah. I, I would hope so. Um, and Lisa, when, when, when is that test taken and how long does that test take? Well, it's only, it, it's a two part test. So it's um, two separate days. Uh, it's usually like two to three hours. Um, and we have not set dates yet because of, um, we just actually got the timeline and are able to now start ordering tests. Okay, okay. But it would probably be definitely, uh, I'm looking at probably May, April, end of April, beginning of May or in May. I, okay. We're not there yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Was there anything else? Is there that's, I think that's everything. Yeah, I'm, if there's any other questions, feel free to call me. Anything else on the agenda? Otherwise, we'll go to into exec. That's a different link. That's a different link. Yeah, it's a different meeting link for exec for everybody online. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.